Our last talk before the break, I have a pleasure of introducing Greg Card and Alice Lashinsky. And in the spirit of Bob McQueen's Chapter 2 talk, I'd like to say that I think Greg and Alice are the dynamic new duo of HAO Instrumentation Chapters 3 and 4. They're heavily involved with instrumentation, eclipses. They have um, both won awards that are just too numerous to mention. So let's please welcome them, and they're going to be talking about HAO Instrumentation. Okay, unfortunately, I need to write things down at the same time. So, um, it has been many. It's on. It's deactivated. Okay, that's all right. Um, does anyone know how to put that up? Thank you. Um, it has been my honor and my privilege to help give life to many HAO ins instruments. Thank you very much. I have my favorites, but I'd like to hear what yours are. <laughs> I've got five minutes. So could you raise your hand, tell me your name, and your favorite instrument that HO has built? And briefly, why like best team ever or best science ever? Do I have any takers? Ray Beauvais in the back? So Ray Beauvais, the white light coronal camera on Skylab. Woo! Because it brought him to HAO. Woo! Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, surely somebody's got a favorite instrument. David? No favorite instruments? Judd Johnson in the back? <laughs> okay, so Judd said, White Life, Coronagraph, Spartan 201. And we had Sherry Lynn raised her hand first. I'm partial to the Fourier tachometer, which uh, helped make uh, some the solar oscillations observations that influenced the change in our model of the sun's inner rotation. Okay, so Sherry Lynn just said, uh, Sherry Lynn Morrow. Uh, was commenting on the Fourier tachometer, which basically changed our ideas of how solar rotation. Thank you. And we had uh, Jack Harvey, is that correct? Really self-serving. So the climax magnetograph, got back out my thesis out of it. <laughs> so Jack Harvey said the climax magnetograph because he got his thesis out of it. Thank you very much. One more person, Scott McIntosh. Okay, so Scott McIntosh said, comp, alphane waves in the solar corona. Okay, I think Greg is all set up and ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Uh, speaking of favorite instruments, wow. Um, so I came to HAO in 1988. I was hired on to um, help with the Spartan 201 light, white light coronagraph. Um, a friend of mine from industry had um, let me know about a job opportunity, and so I came. And since 1988, I've worked on almost 50 projects here, all ground-based, um, ground-based support, ground-based development, and a couple of eclipses, some space-based um, programs, some, some uh, space-based support, sounding rocket stratospheric balloon and now um, can start reviving and renewing the high wind for a reflight. So it's been um, quite a career since 1988. Um, my first week working on the Spartan 201 chronograph, I was writing up some documentation on the work that I was doing and I was um, immediately corrected by Dick Fisher on the correct spelling of chronograph. <laughs> and subsequently then 
um, realized that I had some serious schooling to do since I came from private industry from a company here in Boulder, Colorado Video, that made industrial instrumentation. So the whole world of science instrumentation was new to me. And then this excerpt was from Dick Fisher's handwritten treatise on um, coronagraphs. Um, Spartan 201 was an extension of the partnership of HAO and Smithsonian Astro Astronomical Observatory, Astrophysical Observatory, um, in solar wind generation. And so it was the ultraviolet coronal spectrometer and the um, white light coronagraph. Um, Spartan 201 coronagraph um, was an externally occulted coronagraph, and it was the first of its type to use a single serrated disc occulter as opposed to a traditional kind of three um, regular disc occulter. And then the, um, the image was uh, offset on the field so the spacecraft would have to rotate and clock about the sun. Um, the chronograph was designed and built at HAO, and these are some of the early pictures of, de of the development and buildup of the instrument. The optical bench, the optical bench, the wave plate, quarter wave plate mechanism, um, heat dump mirror, and then the front tube of the chronograph with the sun sensor, the fine sun sensor. And more of the, the early on, early days of the chronograph. And then the electronics, the entire instrument was controlled by a 68,000 computer, and it was uh, programmed in assembly language. And that, was, that programming was done by David Kobe in his spare time when he was um, working ground operations at Goddard for SMM. And this is the entire electronics package, and this is the, um, the CCD camera, the camera head that was on the back of the chronograph. Um, getting the flight hardware ready was, was quite the task, and, and we, had, we wound up with five missions, as it turns out, but a lot of the, the in and out steps of preparing the hardware for each flight was very much the same, where we would come to Goddard and make the coronagraphs, and then go through a considerable amount of time co-aligning the um, coronagraph pixel locations to the slit locations in the... Uh, the UVCS or the ultraviolet coronal spectrometer, and a lot of time with Judd and Dick Fisher and I in, in the clean room uh, doing that work. Then we'd go through and start up, the, once we were happy with the alignment of the instruments, go through the integration process, where we'd build up the instruments, they'd go into a canister. The canister was made up of old black Brant rocket skins as a cost savings measure um, from Goddard. So we'd build up the spacecraft, and occasionally the mounts would require a little bit of uh, persuasion from the clean room mallet. Then we'd go in through and, and finish full-on integration of the spacecraft. And then on the first flight, we had to go through a full thermal vacuum test just to make sure that uh, um, the flight office of assurance was, uh, was happy with um, with the quality of the workmanship, and then continue building on um, and get ready for our, our flights. So this is more of a built up um, view of the spacecraft, and then at the top of the spacecraft there's this funny looking thing called the grapple fixture. Well that's used um, on orbit by the Canada Arm to come and pick Spartan up and deploy it off the um, overboard from the orbiter and let it free fly for a couple of days while it gathered its data autonomously while the shuttle went off and did other things. Then the shuttle would come back and um, pick up the spacecraft and um, latch it back in and bring it back to Earth so we could get our data. And all the data was recorded on board on a flight qualified aviation tape recorder. So. Um, Pretty, pretty old, pretty primitive technology. And so last steps were to install the, the battery packs and do a final pump down of the um, instrument enclosure such that um, the UV detectors uh, in the UVCS were uh, as happy as they could be. This is a summary 
of all five of the flights that uh, Spartan had, starting with um, STS-56 in 1993, then we had essentially a flight a year for five flights. So that was a lot of time in travel um, out at Goddard, um, doing the upside and downside of, of integrating, deintegrating, and retesting um, the white light coronagraph. Um, I'd have to say that my partner in this um, that I spent most of my time with, Judd Johnson, he and I were very well received by um, Code 682, the solar physics group at, at Goddard, as well as the Building 5 people, the Special Payloads Division. And um, Judd and I were given um, opportunities to participate in activities that, more, that most Class D or other, say, Spartan or Hitchhiker payload customer um, payload customers were not allowed um, to participate in. And um, so we had a great deal of access at all of the NASA centers which we visited during uh, the process of, of flying the, uh, the Spartan chronograph. So these are pictures taken at various stages during the, during the different missions where we would have crew training at Kennedy Space Center where we would train the astronauts in the, in the, um, in the uh, birthing and unbirthing procedures of the spacecraft where we would test out with the astronauts um, all of the systems involved in, in deploy and retrieval. And this is the, what's called the RIM or the release engagement mechanism in which the, um, the Spartan sat uh, in the orbiter bay. And this is a full up view of the Spartan on its, um, on its horizontal truss, on its carrier. And this entire portion here then gets integrated into the shuttle. And this is the happy indicator. It tells you if the, if the spacecraft is properly latched in for um, return to Earth. In one of our processing facilities, um, this was the uh, fourth flight, STS-87. We were in a much different facility. And so um, our ride to the launch pad went into this, in this giant uh, vehicle called the canister. And this canister emulates the full size of the shuttle payload, or of the shuttle uh, bay. And so they brought this entire thing into the clean room in which we were working in for that mission. And that was the full weight of the entire spacecraft and bridge structure, so close to 6,000 pounds. And here's some views of um, either integration into the orbiter bay or full integration um, at the launch pad. Then we would have what we'd call payload closeout activities where we would go to the launch pad and remove bagging and other protective covers from the payload and do some final checks on things prior to um, closing the payload bay doors for launch. Then we'd launch the launch it. Um, I got to see two launches out of, out of the five um, because I was involved in mission operations and had to be at Johnson Space Center during the, during the launch phase. And these were part of the, the best and most rewarding of the project was getting these images of the spacecraft on orbit. And during the, during the um, flights, we'd be at the, space, at the Johnson Space Center. So these are pictures from um, one of the standard um, payload operations rooms. Um, since we were um, kind of a low priority payload at the time is that all of our data was recorded um, on board. We didn't have any, 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 in, any interaction with the payload during the flight. And so we would just monitor the voice loops and be there to um, assist mission control personnel or astronauts with any issues should they arise. And then on the downside, when we return back to Kennedy Space Center, we would have a miniature operations center where we could do quick look data um, from the uh, tape recorder once uh, we got the spacecraft back. On STS-87, it was decided by um, Goddard management um, 
to try to increase some of the cap capacity of the Spartan program in the heights of the potentially you know, an advanced Spartan carrier um, that could be deployed and retrieved from um, the International Space Station. So we developed a telemetry link where we could communicate and actually downlink data from the Spartan during the mission. And we would transmit the data from Spartan to the orbiter then from the orbiter via TDRS down to ground stations, and then we could receive data at Johnson Space Center. And then we also had issues on the third flight with the, the tape recorder. And so Judd Johnson had come up with a, a brilliant idea of like, why don't we just take a little PCI, MCIA ruggedized spinning disk, fly it, and let's record the data on that. Well, it worked. It was a great success. We, were, we recorded um, all of that mission's data, the little that we did get, um, on that data recorder just fine. Um, STS-87 had some problems um, uh, during the mission, and the spacecraft wasn't properly initialized. And then in a subsequent um, try to re-grapple and re-initialize, the spacecraft was tipped off and sent into a spin. Um, the crew tried to match attitude of the, of the orbiter with the spacecraft to try to re-grapple it, but then they decided, call it quits, you're going to burn up too much fuel and you're not going to have enough for, for further um, mission objectives and for re-entry. So um, we had to devise what was wrong with the spacecraft and try to do some troubleshooting and create a matrix of all the different aspects of what could have happened. Um, we then had a visit from the um, flight director, and uh, Bill Wagner was there from NASA, NASA, uh, NASA headquarters, um, there checking in on us to see what we were doing. Um, Judd and I then were um, sent off by our mission manager, Craig Tooley, to be part of the, um, the crew to help teach the EVA um, astronauts on the ground, the EVA crew, on how to recover the Spartan spacecraft and get it safely back in such that we could um, get the hardware back. Um, and then so Judd and I spent time at the, um, the WETF or the Sonny Carter Training Facility working with the astronauts on the do's and don'ts and care and feeding of, of the Spartan spacecraft. Then came STS-95, <laughs> our final mission. And this was um, John Glenn's uh, reflight. And so the media had really taken off on the fact that, um, that John Glenn was flying again. And so the rest of us, we kind of got left alone. Um, with our data recorders being um, working so well on the first mission, um, Judd and Dick Fisher and I decided that we would uh, do a complete backup, um, apply the HAO and um, the company that, that Judd had formed at that period of time, Electricon, and fully developed and built two uh, sol uh, spinning disk data recorders, and they recorded the entire mission, um, both, both data paths. Um, STS-95 mission, me and some of the uh, other engineers and technicians, we had an opportunity to go do and go do a walk through um, on our own time and leisure through the vehicle assembly building. So this is the, the, the stack up of the entire STS-95 mission in the vehicle assembly building. It was quite a privilege. And this photo in the lower left, that's the very top of the external tank. So they have work access platforms at all levels uh, in the VAB for, for, for um, access. And so the, the telemetry link worked on STS-95. We were happy. We were getting real-time images from the Spartan chronograph on the ground. Um, however, we ran out of time on our flight rules. And so um, we had built in the capability to uplink off-pointing commands into the pointing system such that we could optimize the occulting in the chronograph. And we were one orbit short of, of um, being able to exercise that, that feature of the, of the two-way communication system. 
And then these are some, uh, some of the pretty pictures from, from some of the flights on the Spartan 201. And the one on the lower right is a overlay of the UVCS slit positions on the field of view of, of the Spartan. And I believe that was Yoko data. Okay. And um, these are just, it was really nice being able to work at Kennedy Space Center and um, working on a National Wildlife Reserve. And so driving in and out every day was, um, was just a wonderful experience with all the wildlife and everything. And then right now, the Spartan 201 spacecraft has been reunited with the shuttle Discovery, and they're both on permanent display at the Udvar Hazy Museum in um, Virginia, outside of Dulles. Next project, um, one that I really liked, was the stair instrument. And um, this was pretty cool. It was a project led by Tim Brown and looking for exoplanets. And he started out with this rudimentary telescope in a wooden shed um, off the other side of Foothills Lab. And he came up with some candidate targets um, for exoplanets for, for observing with um, the Hubble Space Telescope. And then as part of that project, we had to build a dome. And so the, the final version of the instrument was deployed to the Canary Islands. Um, IAC hosted, hosted a site for us um, in Tenerife. And so um, Kim and Alice and a, and a crew of us went out to Tenerife and built the dome and um, deployed the instrument. And I'm running out of time, aren't I? Yeah. I was going to talk quite a bit about um, ballooning. Um, we've gotten back into ballooning since the chronoscope, the last flight of chronoscope two in 2005. And um, so the first one that we got to do was um, sunrise. Um, all of the hardware, um, was the, the gondola and pointing system and power system were built here in Boulder by HAO. Um, we flew on a 34 million cubic foot balloon and made it to an altitude of 120,000 feet. So that's um, 40,000 feet higher than Coronascope 2 flew. And then um, we, uh, we had 7,000 pounds on the balloon, but the balloon weighs 4,000 pounds as well. So it's, uh, it's quite a bit of weight to take to 20, 000, or 120,000 feet. So this is test flight hardware. So this is the 21-foot the tall gondola that was um, designed and built by um, HAO staff, but predominantly by the um, design and fabrication services at INCAR. And then these were parts of the camera system that flew on this test flight. And then some images from test flight activities. And then. Um, Somebody got a good shot of the, of the cut down of the balloon and um, at termination. And there's a penalty with ballooning of severely crushed hardware. And then some of these, these are some of the major components that were produced at, at HAO and, and the design and fabrication services were the, the motor systems and sun sensors. Um, the, the drive systems for the, um, for the telescope and you know, more, more of the sun sensors, as well as all of the pointing system electronics and, and charge control. So we have the pointing system computer, which is housed here. And these are detailed pictures and the motor amplifiers and other distribution units. Then we do go to testing. And so we tested, um, we're allowed uh, to test the pointing system out at um, INCAR's research aviation facility out in Broomfield. So we got to share the hangar with the G5 um, while we did testing out there. And then we also did um, some thermal vacuum testing as well as, um, as mostly just in lab types of activities. And then this is the power system where we've got all the solar panels, lithium ion batteries, and then all the distribution hardware. 
Then we got to Karuna, Sweden, and um, for the first launch, and that was quite an experience. <laughs> And this was our flight path on the first flight from, uh, from Karuna across Greenland to northern Canada. So we just landed just south of Resolute Bay. And then landing and the recovery. And the good news is, is this $1 million plus one meter mirror survived just fine. And here's a sample image of, from the IMAX instrument. Um, we had extremely quiet sun and so um, there was a fair amount of, of work done with the um, with that data as well as um, and then another balloon payload was the high wind which was talked about earlier and um, again all the hardware was built here in Boulder by HAO and the machine and our design and fabrication services we had metal on chamber, lens, camera, all in a self-contained um, pressure controlled observatory. But here's the launch. And so the high wind flew on a 39 million cubic foot balloon. And there's videos from the launches that can be seen in the museum that Alice has put together on um, on running time on that. All right, I think I'm going to leave it with that and end with um, really like to thank Scott McIntosh for letting me out of my office. This is something I don't, I don't normally get to do and really need to thank um, all the people at NASA, at Goddard Space Flight Center, at the Columbia Scientific Ballooning Facility, Balloon Program Office um, for allowing me to participate and be part of HAO's mission um, in accomplishing its goals. And thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful talk. We have time for one question. Yes. Is it true that Elvis flew on Spartan? <laughs> well, I cannot confirm nor deny. Okay. <laughs> I will say that Spartan, on, on one of its trips to Goddard, from Boulder to Goddard, did go through Graceland, yes. <laughs> okay, my apologies. I'm bad at keeping time. Um, we're going to have Bruce Light's talk shortly. So I would ask you to please just come back in five minutes. Just stretch your legs, grab some water, and come on back. We will have two breaks. It's going to be a half-hour break after Bruce's talk. And then we're going to have Tom Bogdan and then a big two-hour party. So thank you.